Welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we talk about investing, hard money, Bitcoin, and how technology is revolutionizing the global economy. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. So this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Make sure you're subscribed to my page so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is made possible through partnerships with companies I trust, and I'm very picky about who I partner with. So I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. First up, Swan. I partnered with Swan because it is a Bitcoin-only company that is focused on helping people save for their future and self-custody their Bitcoin. Swan can help you start a direct deposit to take advantage of Bitcoin as a savings technology and learn how to take it off the exchange. Swan also offers retirement planning with an IRA, tax loss harvesting, and a white glove private client service. I use Swan to dollar cost average, and I deposit a little bit every day that's equivalent to what I might spend on a meal so that I add to my future nest egg and lower my yearly cost basis. Swan Studios produces my hard money news reports, simplifying Bitcoin for mass audiences and documenting Bitcoin adoption around the world. To learn more and get $10 in free Bitcoin, head to swanbitcoin.com slash Natalie Brunel. All right, next up, Bitcoin Conference 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin event, is headed to Nashville next year. Early bird tickets are now available, and this is the lowest cost you'll be able to secure for the conference all year. And if you use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, you'll get an extra 10% off. So come join us for three great days of networking events, panels, keynotes, workshops, and more. You never know what big name might be announced when tickets are much, much higher in price. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL. I'll see you there. All right, it's time for the show. Welcome back, everybody. I am so honored that this guest was willing to talk to me. He doesn't do a lot of podcasts. He's anonymous on Twitter, has a lot of followers. Rudy Havenstein. I'm so grateful for the chance to talk to you. And Rudy, from the looks of it, you sound like you're uh, you're fired up, you said on Twitter. Why are you so fired up? And welcome to the show. Oh, I don't know. I was just uh, thinking about what I might talk to you about today. So I was looking, going through a lot of old inflation tweets and things like that. So, you know, but I'm open to anything. I like, uh, I'll talk, I can talk about just about anything you want to talk about. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get to know you just a little bit better. I heard you on Grant's show mention that you grew up middle class. Your dad was a teacher. I believe your mom took care of the home and you are the fiercest, most clever critic of the bankers and the Federal Reserve. Your tweets are so insightful and uh, I'm just kind of curious what what brought you to that point. So can you share a little bit more about your origin story and your your career path? I know you probably don't want to reveal too much, but but who is the guy behind Ruby, Rudy Havenstein? Well, as I, as I mentioned on, on grants, I was, um, you know, my parents had no, they never owned any stocks. So they had, so I got nothing from them. I never worked in the financial services industry. I guess you could, yeah, not even close to a Wall Street type position. Uh, for some reason, I always um, was just fascinated by the stock market. I mean, I always was working, so I had a little, uh, you know, disposable spending money. So I, you know, did what people should do and learn their lessons when they're young and, and make stupid investments and lose them. You know, when you're young, better do it then. Um, I just was always fascinated by it. And then, uh, but I wasn't paying close attention like I have been for the last like 25 years uh until I would say the late nineties with that bubble, because I was in a, I guess you would, nowadays you would call it a startup, but at the time, you know, we didn't use that term that I was in when I was in that for a couple of decades with a bunch of great guys. And, and, uh, and we, uh, you know, so I started to become more aware of the stock market, you know, during the dot com bubble, which was in a lot of ways, kind of like this one, only the numbers nowadays are just exponentially greater than, you know, you'd have some stupid dot com co company back then that would have like a $300 million, you know, market cap. And now we have stupid companies that have $50 billion market caps. And so the level of insanity has just gotten greater and greater every year of my lifetime. So, uh, and yours too. So, um, uh, I think I, t I mentioned, I wanted, uh, uh, Bill Fleckenstein's the guy that got me interested in the federal reserve specifically, That's right. uh, because he was ranting, uh, very eloquently about uh, Greenspan back in 98 or 99. It's probably about the time frame I started following in the late nineties. And I used to read his stuff and I still do. And, um, and that's when you, you went from what, you know, the stock market as a, as a giant entity to down to um, of the bigger picture, because clearly the federal reserve affects way more than just the stock market. Although that seems to be 
their number one purpose the last 20 years is keeping the stock market elevated and the housing market also. Um, so that was, that got me focused on the Fed. In fact, today, if people say who's the worst villain, you know, and in, in all this, and I, I, you know, certainly I think Bernanke's a sociopath and, and Yellen is, I mean, it's a joke that she's treasury secretary and Powell, you know, we can get into Powell more later. Uh, he, I've clearly had a lot of, uh, slings and arrows I've shot at him, but, uh, I would have to say if I had to pick one person, it would be Greenspan to blame. And of course it's way more than one person, but Greenspan, you know, gave the intellectual cover for the uh, idea that the Federal Reserve is some sort of fourth branch of government. Uh, and now it's, you know, arguably the most important entity in the, in the United States or on, in the world. Um, you know, I mean, other than Biden announcing he's going to launch nukes, which knowing Biden, that's not out of the question. But if, if Powell were to come on and say, you know what, we're hiking up percentage point tomorrow or so, I mean, that would, I mean, so that would devastate, you know, everyone would be jumping out windows. So clearly the Fed is, is extremely powerful now. And I, I've been complaining about this for years and it'd be, it's, it's an unelected power grab by these guys. They've got wow, 30,000 employees. Uh, they can literally create money out of nothing or not money currency, I suppose. And, uh, uh, anyway, it's just, so since then, um, it's just gotten worse and worse. We had the dot-com bubble, which, um, blew up a lot of dumb companies, but didn't really blow the economy up too bad. And, uh, your middle-class kind of, you know, did okay, I guess. And then came the housing bubble, which was just, you know, the people who survived the dot-com bubble got just wiped out in the housing bubble. And, um, I think a lot of our problems now date back to how the housing bubble was massively mishandled. First of all, I mean, you know, our fire marshals, the Fed are, are um, they're always asleep at the switch. You know, they, everything gets set on fire and then they come in at the end and they throw some water on it or they throw trillions at some hedge funds. And then they say, oh, look, we fixed the problem. But that, that hedge, that the way that 2008 was handled was, um, I mean, I think it led to Trump. And I think it, uh, you know, uh, I had faith in Obama. Originally, I was fooled and he was he was terrible. He was he was the greatest friend Wall Street ever had. And uh, and Bush was terrible. I mean, and then Trump came in and he put Goldman Sachs in charge. And, you know, um, hey, you know, now we got uh, who do we have now? I don't know. I think the Obama people run the presidency now because clearly Joe's not in charge. So um, anyway, and then now we got this other bubble, the everything bubble. So. Right. Well, I feel a lot of people um, would say that they are just disillusioned by the whole political process. And I know that right now it seems like we're just divided into two teams, but I think a lot of people are looking for for something or someone else, um, whether that's, you know, some someone to help figure out who to blame for this and someone who's going to rush in to fix it. I know you, you've you you've talked about Whitney Webb's quote on, on one of my shows, this idea that everyone wants a political savior and we have to look beyond that and we have to really focus on our communities, which maybe we'll touch on a little bit later in the show. But I really want to ask you because you're such a, a student of, of our country's monetary history and and these uh, central bankers that you mentioned, you know, Alan Greenspan, I, I do presentations on the history of money where I talk about what he used to say about gold and how it was the only thing that would lead to, you know, restraint and and not having some of the this, the problems of the welfare state and just uh, money printing that's going to debase the currency. And he obviously made a big turnaround. Um, but, you know, going further back, I would just love to kind of hear your perspective on how we got here, because I'm first generation American and my mom dreamt of coming here for the American dream. She waited three decades uh, to be able to come here, didn't make it until her late 30s, early 40s. They started over uh, just as they were able to finally um, afford a mortgage. They lost everything in the great financial crisis. And so my mom has always been, um, first of all, she was always skeptical of the government because she grew up under communism. So she just never trusted really everything that was coming out of um, anything Washington would say or the media would say. Um, but, you know, she she also didn't own uh, stocks and my family mostly saved in cash or they believed in gold, but they just so badly wanted what this country represented, which was the, this idea that you could come from any background and if you work hard, you can achieve 
the middle class American dream. You can afford education for your kids, a roof over your head, maybe a vacation every single year. They didn't want, you know, a yacht or, or billionaire status. They just wanted a nice life for their for their kids and, and the ability for them to get an education and pursue their dreams. So how did we get to a place where America was known as the the beacon, the the center of hope for the idea of of opportunity and social mobility to a place where the 1% owns pretty much everything and everyone else is trying to, you know, fight over the other pieces of the pie. Yeah, it, I, I just, I'll say off the bat, I, I mean, America, you know, is terrible except for all the other countries. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of America, which is part of which makes me so angry at what these clowns have done the last 20 years. And if you look at my pinned tweet, it's not just the monetary guys, it's the, it's the warmongers, you know, Yeah, military. Yeah, industrial, you yeah. know, we can, yeah, we can get into that too. But um, I think what changed is the money changed or the currency changed. We, we had, you know, it was funny during the recent um, discussion about the debt ceiling, uh, you know, all that, which we do periodically and it's a joke and which is why I don't watch any cable news. Cause I don't need to get fired up over stupid stuff. That'll be forgotten a week later. But um, that debt ceiling thing. I mean, we've defaulted three times in the 20th century. People don't, you know, people are like, what? You must never default. Yeah, I, we, yeah. just in the 20th century, we've defaulted three times. We defaulted in 1933 when FDR basically made gold, which was constitutionally enshrined in and silver in the Constitution of the United States, which no one really pays attention to anymore. They default, they, they confiscated that and you had a $10,000 fine, I think something like 10 years in jail if you didn't hand in your gold. Um, in 1968, they demonetized silver because you remember back in, uh, maybe you don't remember, you're too young, but back in the 60s, you could get, so, so there were still silver coins, you know? And um, yeah, and then in 1971, Nixon came on TV one day, uh, basically, what's today? Yeah, August 7th. Okay, so about a week from today, uh, back in 1971, mm -hmm. um, Nixon came on and said, hey, you know, we're going to try and save everybody. And we got these profiteers and speculators are gambling on the dollar. So we're going to, temporarily, uh, you know, uh, stop the exchange of gold for dollars. Uh, so that was, that was a massive default on foreigners. They defaulted on the American citizens in 1933 and they defaulted on the foreigners in 1971. Cause I think, you know, we're spending tons of money then on Vietnam, although it's a fraction of what we spend mm -hmm. now, but, um, and, uh, the French were saying, Hey, give us, we'll take your gold, you know, well, here's, here's some dollars. We'll take gold. So they couldn't keep that up. They would have lost all their gold. And if you look, you know, not that I think, I mean, you know, it's like saying end the Fed. I don't expect the Fed to end, but I'd like to have it put on a, a leash, you know, and it's like the thing with, uh, you know, the gold standard. I'm saying, not saying that was perfect, but I'm saying something changed when we went off mm -hmm. physical backing for our currency. And, and, and it changed in a way that absolutely benefits people like Larry Fink and Barry Sternlicht and Steve Schwartzman and Bill Ackman through the Cantillon effect, which just Google the Cantillon effect and you can see what I'm talking about there. The people with the closest access, the first access to the money uh, are able to um, make the most of it. And by the time Joe Sixpack uh, sees it, you know, he doesn't get any benefits from it. He just sees that, you know, the burger he used to pay $5 for is now 15 or $20. So that was huge. And that affects everything we you know, every price of everything. Um, I've been railing about inflation for 10 years on, on here. And uh, because 95% of the, of the people you see on FinTwit, you know, the big traders and the big, and the billionaires you see on CNBC, they love inflation. They're highly levered. They own assets. Um, you know, there was a great review of Edward Chancellor's book, um, uh, the Price of Time, which is a highly recommended book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's the people, um, the only people that can borrow money at, you know, low at super low rates generally and buy, you know, up a bunch of assets are people who are wealthy. So whether it's, it's people who can buy a house or people who, like, you know, that can buy 50,000 houses like some of these private equity guys have done. Right. Um, you know, your average citizen, even before, even when rates were zero or, for Blackstone, they were, you know, credit cards were 20% for Joe six pack. And, uh, and now they're 25% or something. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, so anyway, that's the thing. It just changed. I was looking at the CPI from the federal reserve. They have a site called Fred, just type in Fred space CPI mm -hmm. and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But, uh, they actually chart back to 1913, the, the their official CPI, 
which I think is understated nonsense. I, but since everyone seems to think it's gospel. So since, so from 1913 to 1971, when Nixon went off the gold standard, the CPI went up four times in 58 years, the official CPI. You know, we all know that doesn't have anything to do with the cost of living, but four times. So the CPI since then has gone up seven and a half times in 52 years. So 58 years, it goes up four times, then they go off gold, then it goes up seven and a half times in, in the next 52 years. So my point is just that something massively changed when we went off gold. And every country on earth is off gold, uh, including the Swiss, who are like the last holdouts. Yep. And now the Swiss now the Swiss just prints money and, and converts it to dollars and buys Apple shares. I mean, I, I think they're smart to do that because they're buying real assets with, with literally electrons yep. and yep. nobody cares. Nobody cares. And um, I'm sure China's doing it too and other countries are doing it. Supposedly the United States isn't doing it, but I, I posted a quote from Michael Howell, you know, on one of these podcasts where he's talking about in 1987 during the crash, he was walking by a trader who said, hey, I was just on the phone with the Federal Reserve. They're, they're buying futures. And first of all, that's illegal. But if Michael Howell is correct and he's a very popular guest on all these things, this stuff was going on back in 1987. Can you imagine what they're doing today? Right. So, you know. And and I mean, I it's sorry, I'm kind of I told you I was fired up, but I mean, if you oh, look at it. if you look at the stock market, okay, and I I I am going to do a thread I think when we're done with this and I hear it and then like post all the things I'm talking about so people can go check out, oh, this Perfect. is what he's talking about. But like the Federal Reserve comes out with this thing and they break it down by the top 1.1% and then the other 0.9% and then the next 10% and then the next 40% and then the bottom 50 of who owns stocks. Mm -hmm. So from, this is when the data begins and ends. So from 89 to 2023, so okay. So from 1989 to now, the only group that has gained about 10% of, of, of the own, I mean, of the ownership of stocks has been the top 1%. Every other group is losing ground against the 1%, including the top nine, including nine of the top 10%. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the top, 0.1% now own 22.2% of corporate equities and mutual funds. And the top 1% together with the, you know, the overall top 1% own 53.6%, which is over 10% higher than they owned 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So all these policies, all these years, oh, we're going to save Joe Sixpack and his, and his 401k. All they've done is massively increase wealth inequality. And in fact, uh, no less than Stan Druckenmiller said it like five years ago. He said, there is no greater um, thing in existence today exacerbating wealth inequality than QE. He says it's not even debatable. And this is a guy who benefits massively from QE. So, Yeah, he recently said some interesting things about our, our uh, debt obligations as well and the, the programs. We, we absolutely cannot continue funding things like Social Security, but we won't admit it. And it's political suicide. Um, you know, I want to dig into this a little bit more because before I learned about Bitcoin, um, I did not. The, I, the word inflation really didn't come across my radar as anything that I should be paying attention to. And inflation is literally defined as the expansion of the money supply. We think of it today, I think, as the result of what happened in the pandemic as, um, you know, CPI and your prices just going up. But it is literally the expansion of the money supply. And we can look at the Fed's balance sheet, which obviously most people don't. But I I just go back in, t in in terms of my mind of when I was studying and I was in all the AP classes. I worked really hard because I had something to to prove. I had, you know, a immigrant work ethic where I just wanted to have um, good grades to to make sure that I can help take care of my family and my parents and, and justify the sacrifice they made. And I never learned about money printing. I never learned about all these things that are probably the most important things to understand in terms of financial literacy and economic education. And I went to top schools. Why yeah. do you think that is? Why do you think our education program is one in which you could you could be a graduate of Harvard and you could basically think that two percent inflation is is good and it's uh, we we do have a um, capitalism in this country when I would say all we have is crony capitalism. I mean, how is it so backwards in the country that, again, was founded on freedom, self-determination, independence? How did, how did that happen? Well, financial education in this country in general is, is abysmal. 
And so one of the, re and, and, and of course, I think the economics profession is largely abysmal. I mean, they are lost in their math models. They, they, they're, the, the physics envy stuff is true. There's, and there's no group more or less self-aware than an academic economist. And, and, and unfortunately these guys, um, have taken over the economics profession and the federal Res and fealty to the federal reserve is, is a requirement nowadays because the federal reserve controls the publications. It controls all of the top, you know, uh, economic entities. And so unless you're kissing the feds, butt, your, your career is not going to advance. And I, and I think that's been a huge benefit to me is I didn't, I, I mean, I, I took an economics class in college where did I learn all all this stuff that, from my perspective, I think is the correct way to look at it from reading history. It said one of my first tweets was, forget economics, learn history, and maybe psychology too, right? And then, because these guys are clueless, and I found that over the years. I mean, they literally see inflation differently than we do. There's a Schiller uh, study he did years ago where he asked, well, what's the worst thing about inflation? You know, And one of the options was, oh, it makes my cost of living go up and I have I can't afford things. And that was like 75% of the, of the public answered that as the problem with inflation. And maybe like 11% of economists answered that as their top thing. They don't think the way exactly. normal people do. And they they're the they're they're in that Eisenhower speech in my twins uh, in my pen tweet they're they're the techno technocracy that uh, or techno however you pronounce it uh, that mm -hmm. Eisenhower warned about these these uh, these little elites they're unelected they're unaccountable I mean look at all the trading scandals you know insider trading yeah. and they're like I mean how long have they been around almost a hundred years or more than a hundred years and since 1913 and they're like oh okay we just discovered that maybe we shouldn't be doing this and then bostic just was redoing it again the other day i mean it was in the in the, you know, the last couple months and and the, there's no accountability ever for these guys this is here's the thing three years ago every single person on the fomc was calling for higher inflation and they wanted now first of all when inflation when official inflation is one or two percent i was I, I was always saying it's like six or eight percent. Okay, but okay, fine. Let's one or two. They they were calling for higher inflation, and in fact, you had guys like Crash Car. I think said, "Oh, I'd, I'd be fine with four percent inflation." And and there's a lot of people that talk like that now. Let's move the rate up to let's move the target up to four. They don't have any four percent target. They don't have a two percent target. They pulled that out of the same place that Cash mm -hmm. pulled the TARP numbers. They. It's made up. It comes from some idiot New Zealand like 30 years ago or something. That's what they all, that's the origin story on that. Their mandate in the 1977, I think, revision of the Federal Reserve Act is stable prices. Mm -hmm. not, not stable inflation, but yeah. stable prices because inflation is a tax. Right. And I've also, and this is all going to be in my thread I'm going to do on this because Bernanke himself talking to Ron Paul 15, no, gosh, let's see, it'd be 2010, so 13, 14 years ago. Uh, inflation is a tax. Bernanke says to him, he says, I agree with you 100%. And, it, and it's too high. And back then, when he said that, I looked it up and the core inflation was about 2.3%, I think. And uh, and then, we not, you know, now we had, I forget what core was, but headline went up to over nine. And, and they've adjusted and monkeyed with CPI calculations so much over the years that if, you know, I mean, health insurance is my number one expense. They don't, they, you think, people think, oh, CPI is what's the cost in year one and what's the cost in year two and what's the delta in that? What's the difference in that? And that, that what percentage is that? And that's the CPI. No, no, no. They monkey with it so much. They, first of all, they don't measure health insurance, my biggest expense. And they, they, they use all these, oh, they, they came up with something in the, uh, I think it was in the eighties. They had a substitution where they said, Oh, you know what? Burgers have gone up. So, you, so now you eat, now you eat chicken. Now you eat, you know, bugs like yeah. the WF. And then they came up with the hedonic adjustments, which are great. So for 25 years from about 1995 until recently, uh, new car prices, according to the BLS, never went up. If you look at the chart, it's, it's they never went up. And right. that went into the CPI. And there's other things like that. And it's, what do you mean they never went up? Anybody with a brain, half a brain knows and a you know, I mean, some economists apparently don't have half a brain because they, they will set, tell you with a straight face, oh, no, no, no. There was no price change for 25 years in new cars. In fact, some years they went down. Well, what they do is they say, okay, you have new side airbags. And so we're going to say that, that you know, okay, so the car went up five grand, but, you know, those airbags were, that's probably six grand worth of value there. So we're, we're going to mark you down. We're going to say that car went down a thousand dollars. Right. It's all manipulated, it, right? 
it's it's absurd. And and of course, your wages, you know, your income, whether you're a retiree on a fixed income or whether you're a construction worker living on wages, it doesn't get hedonically adjusted. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why I hate the term adjusted for inflation, because that that means that assumes that everybody's everybody is like a rising tide lifts everybody the same. No, mm-hmm. it doesn't. It lifts Barry Sternlick, you know, real high. And I pick on him because he was on TV months ago crying for more inflation. We need more inflation. Well, he wants uh, Starwood to be able to keep raising the rents at 15 or 20 percent a year, which they're not going to be able to do probably now. So he's going to go crying. I can't wait for this, the coming CRE bailout from the Fed. You know, they're probably just going to start buying, you know, office buildings or something. These guys are insane. For sure. Never underestimate how insane these guys will get to protect their future employers, I mean, mm-hmm. or the top 1%. It's insane. And people say, well, you know, no, 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 you're no. look at the results. Look at a chart again on Fred, do, type in Fred space, uh, top 1%. You'll see that the, the, the percentage of wealth in this country owned by the top 1% has gone from about 23% to over 32% in the last 30 years. And when have we had easy money? And when have we had an activist fed more than ever? Yep. And it, it's just, right. it's crazy. And the reason I started doing this, like I, I mentioned before with the other podcasts I've done that I was doing emails, you know, for years to my friends because, and these are all smart guys and they're, you know, some of them are very successful businessmen and, but they had no clue about the fed or no clue about any of this. Cause they're too busy working. Like most people, hopefully, I mean, I, I'm listening to this, they, you know, it, exactly. it's, and yet it affects everybody's lives to a huge extent and there's no accountability. There's no accountability for the Fed calling for higher inflation. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference tickets with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can win free Satoshis every day or even play for a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. You can also buy Bitcoin and stack sats directly on Fold and earn even more incentives and rewards. This is a great app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin and way better than earning airline miles or hotel points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie. And if you use my link, you'll get up to 10,000 sats when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. I'm so excited to share that I have partnered with CoinKite and we are committed to making sure everyone has the information they need to safely self-custody their Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I am switching to for safekeeping my Bitcoin. It is Bitcoin only, you can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and as I'm learning, it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. If you head to their site in my show notes, you can find all of their products from cold cards in different colors to seed plates, top signers, sats cards, block clocks, which I have behind me, and more. I'm also in the process of creating some how-to videos on cold card, so watch out for those in the near future. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. All right, back to the show. And there's no accountability. There's no accountability for the Fed calling for higher inflation. Exactly. No, these policies are so pernicious and they're able to hide the real inflation in assets, which only benefits the top, like you've mentioned. It really has hollowed out this country. And I think that the middle class was one of our biggest sources of strength um, and national security. And we've lost so much of that. And of course, like you mentioned earlier, it, it is so much worse in many, many places, but if we're going in this direction, then um, it, it's kind of scary to think about the future. Uh, and I think we see it peeling apart the morality of, uh, of society. I think people have, are, are losing values, their value systems. And um, I, I just, I'm really curious because I think that most people are good. And so there's that famous Mark Twain quote, right? It's, um, Sometimes I wonder if the world is run by smart people who are putting us on or Im- imbeciles who really mean it, right? Is that the quote? Yeah, yeah um, something like that, yeah. You know, I think about that because I, I, do you think that these central bankers who you criticize, do you think that they're evil? Do you think that it's just, you know, you, you, you make one action and then the next one happens and you're just kind of in this, this domino roll of, um, of circumstances? Do you think that they mean well and they're just cl- clueless? I, I mean, what do you think are the intentions of the people that are leading these policies? 
there there's a great quote that i came across and i instantly thought of federal reserve the evil of aristocracy is not that it necessarily leads to the infliction of bad things or the suffering of sad ones the evil of aristocracy is that it places everything in the hands of a class of people who can always inflict what they can never suffer and that's exactly right powell's worth more than 100 million dollars yellen is worth tens of millions of dollars and just two years after being the biggest bank regulator she gave Zoom speeches to Citigroup and Citadel and other entities that she formerly would have regulated, uh, made $7.2 million. Okay, so there's no corruption there. It's a delayed bribe, in my opinion, but I'm not a lawyer. And then you got Ben Bernanke, I hear now is raking in $20 million a year from Citadel. I mean, I, I don't have any evidence. And he's in charge of what? Smart, figuring out what happened with inflation in England? He, I mean, it's ridiculous. He's just, yeah. Oh, that's absurd. That's like, I, I think I said, what well, was like asking Ted Bundy to, to figure out why the murder rate is up or something? Yeah. yeah. No, Bernanke is uh, just the most contemptible person around. I don't think he has any, I think he's proud of what he did and he thinks he's great. And I've heard anecdotes from people who actually met him um, and they, 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 they give the same impression. This guy is he has no um, no empathy for the people he's he's ruined. He works for the people he's benefited. You know, uh, he works for Pimco too, by the way. In fact, I think everybody at uh, the FOMC is required at some point in their life to work at Pimco. If you notice the roster there, Greenspan's worked there. Kashkari cashed in there. Um, I think uh, I don't know if Stan Fisher was there, but I know he's at BlackRock. And then you've got Richard Fisher. He's at uh, uh, Barclays. You know, I was and whenever uh, whenever. Uh, Whenever uh, Jeff Staley was on, you know, I was always texting the CNBC about him and Epstein. I mean, this is years ago, you know, now now everyone knows about it. But um, it's, by the way, I was an aside. This is why I want, I mean, I agreed. Well, among other reasons, you're a very nice interviewer, but that uh, you did a great podcast with uh, Whitney Webb, like Marty Bent, when it was the last podcast I was on. So that really, uh, I, hey, anybody that's a friend of Whitney Webb is a, is a friend of mine because I think she's doing the most important work out there. Yes. So way more important than what I'm doing, but I'm trying to do my part and spread the word on what she has to say and also what I have to say. So, Well, you definitely are. I mean, uh, just out of curiosity as a tangent, wh why do you want to remain anonymous? Is it because you're so critical and people have faced, you know, severe consequences I, and you, you are, you uh, already experienced efforts to silence you and, and been yeah. deplatformed. So is that one of the reasons you don't want people to know who you really are? I think I don't want to expose, I mean, I've made, I've, I've made a lot of criticisms of the Saudis. Okay. So, you know, we know what they're capable of. So I, that's pro that's probably, there's a lot of, you know, crazy people out there. Um, Somebody was, you know, whenever someone was talking about, oh, anonymous, I mean, Kashkari, I think it was, you know, where are the, uh, where are the anonymous trolls directed at me years ago during one of his Ask Neil things, his only Ask Neil thing, because he got bashed so hard he never did another one. Um, what I what I post is either true or it's not, you know, and so it doesn't matter who I am. And um, mm -hmm. I talk against my book every day. And uh, whether you believe it or not, that's what I do. I mean, uh, the Fed policies as uh, have been uh, pretty good for me personally. Uh, they've been horrific for people I know and for the country as a whole. So I'm not a sociopath. There's a, there's a great uh, John Bogle excerpt from his book where he says, I think it was uh, Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller are at a hedge funders party, probably one of Bernanke's friends years ago. And I think Vonnegut says to Heller, hey, uh, this guy makes more in one year than your, all your books have ever made in, you know, in your lifetime. And Joseph Heller says, well, yeah, but I, I have something this guy will never have. And Vonnegut goes, Vonnegut goes, what's that? And he goes, I have enough, you know? Oh, that's right. So, yeah. I read that in the these, psychology of money. Yeah. These guys never have enough. Yeah. They never have enough. Why is Larry, Larry Summers has, again, he's like, he's like Powell and Yellen. He's got tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. That guy has been a lifetime grifter. Uh, and he's just, he's, he's a big villain up there too. Him and Geithner too. Um, why does he need to keep every day? Every day he's on Bloomberg. Every day he's a pining. This is one of the worst. Forget the whole Epstein thing with him, which is a whole story in itself. But just his policies that he's done to this country over the years are horrific. And nobody cares. He's an idol of the economics profession. Although, you know, sometimes some people don't like him because he was criticizing the Fed, whatever. You know, it's it, Larry. And then, of course, Larry comes out as Matt Stoller, who's a good guy to follow, said the other day, like Larry can. Larry will come from every side of every issue and claim that he was he was there all along. 
So, uh, I mean, why they have enough? Why are they why are they around? Why is Jack Lou still coming on CNBC? You know, well, I think a lot of people in the audience wonder all the time how how do people not get punished or have con consequences when whatever their policies were led to the destruction of parts of our society. Uh, why are people that are in their 80s still in office when they need yeah. kids to serve as power of attorney? Why aren't they retired somewhere? Especially those that have, you know, how did how did they earn a hundred million dollars while serving as as someone who's supposed to be our public official uh, making a, a pretty modest salary? I think a lot of people have those questions. So let's dig into some of the central bankers. You know, you mentioned Jerome Powell. Um, I read the book Lords of Easy Money. I did not know mm -hmm. about his background. I knew that he was, you know, independently wealthy, uh, but I did not know about some of the some of the things that he did in the in the previous firms he he worked for, which again I think have contributed to just this this decimation of the working class and the inability for people to save. Um, so now he has this position. He everyone looks to him as the the man who controls the the money across the entire world, which is insane, right? We have one person who decides rates and monetary policy. Can you shed light on on who this person is? Because some some folks out there, some analysts defend him, saying that he you know, is trying to end quantitative easing to try to uplift the American worker and make it so that we don't have such bad wealth concentration and you know, is trying to stand up to the other bankers who want to continue QE. Can you shed light on whether that's true? Yeah, I think um, at first, you know, Powell came in and he was uh, in 2018, you know, remember he started raising rates then and he got him up to about two and 2.4 percent or something. And uh, the market went down like 20 percent. And every day on CNBC, people are saying with a straight face, this is the worst weeks and worst month since it's 1931. And I just was just responding to those like, are you insane? This is nothing like 1931, you goofballs. But that to them, well, technically, OK, it was a December drop or something. So he so Powell turned tail and immediately in January 2019 said, oh, OK, we're done. We're going to start cutting again. And they did. And they got and uh, then, you know, um, so so I thought he chickened out and I thought he was terrible for until um, with the past year when he started hiking rates, you know, um, and we're only up to average rates. We're, we're up to normal rates. I mean, people think the last 15 years were the norm. They're the aberration in my, in my mind. You can see mm -hmm. that if you look on a long-term chart, I was trying to look on a long-term chart, not on like, you know, the last four quarters or something. And, uh, I think he's also not an econ PhD, <clears throat> excuse me, not an econ PhD, which, uh, you know, people say, oh, well, they use that as a criticism initially. And I'm like, well, that's, that's the best thing about him. He's not an econ PhD because those people are brain dead. And, you know, I, I mean, by and large, I mean, I have a few, I have some great econ PhDs, genius guys that follow me and, and they're, but they're not from the, uh, they're what you would call heterodox uh, economists. They, they're not like the, the Larry Summers and the Ben Bernanke's of the world. But um, so Powell, I think, um, I don't know. He comes from a private equity background. I'm sure all his friends are fabulously wealthy. He himself uh, had a career of, um, you know, being a plutocracy all-star. Um, and everything he did in the first few years, certainly as Fed chair, was right up that alley. The last year, uh, we've gone back to normal rates. Now, we did it quickly, so everyone's freaking out. But um, a lot of the problems we have now are not because of the 5% of the, uh, rates. It's because of the stupid stupid ZERP policy that we had for over a decade. And of course, the nine trillion of QE that they that they did, um, which is basically another form of uh, lowering rates. I think people say, oh, no, no, no. They rates go, you know, whatever. They, listen, sell those nine, sell eight trillion of those bonds like um, Bernanke promised in 2010. And uh, we'll see where rates go. Actually, Ron Paul, again, you know, said to Bernanke, where do you want to see the balance sheet? This is, I think, in 2010. And Bernanke goes, oh, we want to see it, you know, back down to a level where we have enough cash and, and uh, you know, under a trillion, under a, under trillion. a trillion, under a trillion. And then we went to nine trillion. So everything Bernanke said is basically BS. And the guy's, like I said, I, I think the guy's a psychopath. I really do. I mean, uh, I have nothing but contempt for that guy. And um, but Powell, I don't I, uh, I don't have the same feeling for because I think he. I think maybe he realized he screwed up because it would have been so much easier to raise rates. There was so much less debt in 2018 than there is now. You know, that would have been the chance to do it. Instead, they got back down 
And then COVID hit and then they went, well, then Powell went insane. And I think maybe, you know, everyone was kind of crazy back then. Um, and uh, they, they were like printing, you know, they were buying MBS though. And so that was a huge mistake, huge, I think it probably illegal. Um, you know, why, why are they doing that? Uh, even the treasury, I mean, all it is, is they're monetizing debt, you know, and Bernanke's was quoted years ago. Oh, no, we're not going to monetize the debt. That means using the debt to fund the budget. Right. Well, pff, yeah. What do you think we're doing? I mean, come on. Exactly. So, I mean, that's what, that's what all the banana republics do. And, um, but we're the reserve currency and most people think that can never end. And so it's good. It's fine. As long as, you know, it's fine until it isn't, you know, gradually then suddenly. So, so can, can you share more of your thoughts around that? I mean, obviously, you refer a lot to uh, the devastating effects of hyperinflation that happened in, in the Weimar Republic. Bitcoiners talk about that a lot. Um, a right. lot of us are really passionate about educating people so that they do protect themselves with a form of money that the, the government can't manipulate. So maybe I'll right. maybe I'll ask you about Bitcoin in a little bit. But just this idea of how things are changing geopolitically, countries forming Bricks, uh, de-dollarizing using their own currencies to to settle trade, uh, moving back to uh, obtaining a lot of gold for the central banks. I mean, where where do you see this in the next maybe ten to twenty years? Because um, I'm guessing you don't think that the dollar will remain global reserve currency, or do you think it still has a bit of a lifespan since it's so entrenched in the global financial system? I think I just texted a photo the other day of a book from 1969 called "The Death of the Dollar." So. Be aware that there have been people calling for the demise of the dollar for uh, even before we went off gold, actually, yeah. back then. Um, so for since 1969 at, at, at the you know, maybe even earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So I am not I still accept dollars. Uh, <laughs> but I th there's a reason I have my uh, my handle. You know, Rudy, uh, I always say Havenstein, but I guess Havenstein a lot of people say. So I don't know. I don't, I'm not. You know, people maybe figure out now I'm not really. A German banker born in 1857, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's, I, but there is a lot of um, historical precedent for exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's bad. It's really bad. And I don't, and I've written before, I don't see it. I certainly don't think the United States will be first and it may be another 50 years. I mean, you know, we've been off uh, gold. So uh, since what, 50 years, and maybe it'll be another 50 years. And I don't see the US going first. Uh, but it's gonna, I mean, unless something dramatic changes, it's, it's, I think it's, it's an eventuality. And hyperinflation, which is basically a currency collapse, it's not like 20% inflation every day, you know, or every right. uh, month, it's, it's, a, it's a currency collapse, it's a panic out of a currency. And I've read a ton, a ton of books on it. And, um, uh, you know, German marks were very um, widely held by investors until they weren't, you know, um, it's it's a it's it's a phase shift. It's like a paradigm shift and it'll happen very quickly. I mean, I you know, and as for gold, you know, like why are this, you know, they, uh, again, Ron Paul, I got to well, maybe ask me about him later. He go he he's talking to Bernanke at least probably 15 years ago, you know, is gold, is gold money? And, and, you know, Bernanke's like, well, no. And then he's like, well, why do you hold it? Well, it's an asset. And then Paul goes, uh, well, aren't diamonds also an asset? And Bernanke goes, well, tradition, that's why we hold the tradition. So they're buying more gold than ever right now. Yeah. I mean, and, and, uh, not the U S the U S still, the U S has a lot of, well, who knows? It hasn't been audited in forever, but, exactly. uh, uh, but Russia and China certainly uh, are believers in gold. And I think a lot of countries are. And uh, gold is money, as J.P. Morgan, the original, said, you know, over 100 years ago. You know, uh, it's nothing else. It's money. That's why I kind of differentiate between currency and money and why um, Bitcoin people. And, you know, I always have to say I'm just a Luddite. I, 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 I could be a Bitcoin billionaire now, but I'm not. But I am certainly aware of it. And I certainly uh, support. Uh, support your right to own it. And I think I understand why you do. And there's a lot of common ground between uh, the old timers like me and the, and the young people, which I think is great. And uh, uh, so my thinking on Bitcoin was just, I always, I always believe that it, if it ever became a real threat to the U S dollar, uh, they would absolutely crush it. Absolutely. I mean, we've gone to war over, over stuff less than that, you know? So um Apparently, they don't think it's an existential, it's a, it's a threat to the dollar. And I don't either. I mean, I've had people come to me and say, oh, you know, Bitcoin is going to be the um, reserve currency of, of the world. And the few, and I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't see it, but I, don't, I certainly am not against Bitcoin or, or the people who support it. And um, I think we're just, uh, 
we're like, as I put it one way, we're, we're both the Bitcoin and the, I guess you could call it, say I'm more of a gold person for business of my old fashioned. Sure. We're like pass- passengers on the same hijacked plane. So it's like, <laughs> hey, buddy, we're, we're in different seats, but let's let's go get these guys, you know. Yeah. And so I, I certainly am happy. You know, I've gotten a lot of young people and some great Bitcoin people follow me. And uh, and I and uh, even though I'm not, uh, you know, uh, a, what, what do we call, a maximalist, uh, you know, uh-huh. I, I certainly I certainly am not your enemy. So uh, and that's I just want to say that's another thing with not just on on money, but on anything uh, between the left and the right and all that is is common ground. Um you know, there's certain things like one over the years I thought was always a no brainer for conservatives and liberals and whatever, whatever those terms mean now is like civil forfeiture. You know, yeah. I was like, how could I think conservatives and liberals should be hand in hand on that, you know, and I think they should be hand on hand on that against the Federal Reserve. I am amazed that the Federal Reserve's biggest supporters are tend to be people who call themselves progressive. And it's, it's stunning to me that there, I mean, this entity is arguably the most worst thing for about 90% of the population. I mean, it's proven. I can show you the charts of what happened to people when we've had an activist fed and they don't get it. I think that they like, and Congress loves it because Congress it's, it's, um, it's like a, you know, Congress is the heroin addict and the fed gives them is their dealer. They, they love not having to make tough decisions. Congress yeah. because the fed will just buy the bonds yep. and, and, it's 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 really they, they love the Fed. The only people like you get a poser like Liz Warren who criticize the Fed once in a while. That's just because she wants the fund coupons directed more to what she wants. Yeah. You know, they're going to yeah. they're going to say they're going to save the climate, you know, yeah. the Federal Reserve. You know, these guys that are the worst banker regulators on Earth, provably. And yeah, they're going to they're going to fix the climate. And they're going to create inequality and they're going to help minorities. You know, I was texting these guys. I would tag every single Federal Reserve that's on Twitter. And I would say. Hey, back in 2020, when they're every, everybody's saying we need higher inflation, we need higher inflation. And I would be like, can you explain to me how higher inflation is good for the Hispanic workers that your next tweet talks about? And never got a response. They don't. I know they see them. I know there are some guys at the Fed that see my stuff. And because uh, I've gotten into it with, with a couple of them once in a while, but uh, including Neil Kashkari. But they, they're 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 so tone deaf. They don't get it. They they simply those don't St. Louis Fed will put out tweets like, you know, hey, what can be done about wealth inequality? And I'm like, oh, my God, are you guys completely clueless? And I think right. they are. I think they're in a bubble. They all make even at the Fed, you know, everybody, you know, they're all making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Everybody yeah. says, well, they do because they're math PhDs. Yeah, but they're screw a math PhD that a, that's a messes with 300 million Americans. Right. You know, so they, they are hurting people badly. And I don't think you should pay them anything. I should fire them all. You know, replace the Fed with a two-year note, and then someone goes, "Oh, the, the Fed is so important." Fine, they can they can cash checks, and they can do give tours to school children. They can do banking stuff, and maybe try to think about doing some bank regulation. But don't be telling me that you're gonna you're gonna save you're gonna stop you know the oceans from warming. You know, I mean, it's just absurd. And the idea that Janet Yellen is Fed is a Treasury Secretary is is like is a joke. She is she's a joke. And I'm sorry, but she is. And people say, oh, you, know, you can't say that because she's a woman. Well, you know what? 95% of the people I bash all the time are, are very wealthy white guys. So I, it's nothing to do with her being a woman. It's due to her being an idiot and a disaster who's really hurt America, most of America, but well, really helped, uh, you know, Larry Fink. Well, really, I mean, I have to tell you, when I was a news reporter, I can't, I can't tell you the amount of times that I just felt like the people that I was covering or interviewing who held these important positions from local to national were just so incompetent. I mean, it goes back to that, yep. that quote that I read you about for uh, Mark Twain, you know, imbeciles that are, that really mean it because I just felt like they are so truly ignorant to what the average person is going through and the way that our system works in terms of elections, you know, you're, you're beholden to your, um, to your donors and it's yeah. it's a lot of buying you know positions and then you get to stay in them pretty much for life and those relationships just feel so so corrupt um so you know i really want to ask you in the spirit of being constructive what are things that we could actually do to fix these problems i mean i'm certainly someone who believes we should have term limits i really think that we should address the money so that we don't have this runaway 
inflation and monetary policy with zero interest rates. But there's, I mean, we've blown up the bubble so big. There are going to be consequences. And we could sit there and argue whether it's going to be a hard landing, soft landing. At some point, obviously, they're going to need to come in, right, and print and continue to debase the currency and to widen the wealth gap. Um, so what are things that can make it better? Um, if you were in office, what would you do? Well, people... People say, oh, you know, the Fed's going to hike until something breaks. And that that makes it sound as if something hasn't already broken. Take a take a look at a chart of the net worth uh, of, the, of the of the 50th to 90th percentile in the last 30 years. It's straight down and the one percent is straight up. And so something yeah. already broke. Our middle class broke. And um, what can be done? Well, it's a problem because we, Congress is ultimately the problem because Congress created the Fed and Congress can rein the Fed in. But Congress doesn't want to rein the Fed in. There's like two or three congressmen that want to do it. There's no Ron Paul nowadays who was right on foreign and monetary policy for 40 years, you know, and the GOP hated him, you know, more than they, more than the Democrats did. And so what's the, well, first thing I would do is I'm Fed chair. Okay. Except if I can't disband it is um, get rid of those MBS. What are you doing in the mortgage market? You own, they own zero until 2008. Mm -hmm. And then they went insane then. And then they went really insane for no reason. There's a guy on Twitter called Randy Woodward who, who works with banks. I mean, he sells bonds to banks and he gives an explainer on, he's like, I'm baffled by it. I don't know why they were doing it. My clients were buying MBS back then. You know, why was the Fed suddenly buying? And he thinks they were doing it to bail someone out. And of course that was, you know, Chris Leonard's another book everyone should read, The Lords of Easy Money. And he gives a little anecdote in there about back in September, 2019, before COVID, well before COVID, they were bailing out hedge funds that were making bad bets. And, uh, and that's when they restarted QE. So this all the thing that they did this to save us for COVID was BS. If you go through my stuff in March 2020, I was proud of those tweets because I called it. I did basically said the sound you hear right now is the Gini ratio going up. So what can we do? We need I'm a nonviolent guy, so I'm going to go with systemic changes. You have to vote out the people that are supporting this. OK, first of all. Now, I know that's it's so naive, but you have to. And I've had people yell at me or not yell at me, but give me crap because I said both these guys out and they're like laughing, like, oh, voting, like voting matters. I know. I know. I know. But I'm not ready to take up a musket because the guy, the guys that are going to come for you aren't guys with muskets like in 1776. The guys that are going to come for you are going to have, you know, attack helicopters and stuff and, and, you know, sound weapons and things. So it's not, you know, just be careful what you wish for everybody. We don't, we're not going to have a civil war, you know, and all that sort of stuff. We need to figure this out. We've been through worst times in America. People say, oh, this is the most divided America's ever been. I said, you know, we had a civil war, right? Where mm -hmm. like 500,000 people died. Right. So, uh, but you got, you got to bottoms up, go to, Support a city council person, support a state senator. I don't know what I mean. I've been trying to do that locally and with limited success. Um, you got it. I don't know. I mean, we got to call these guys out. I think that's been my thing. People say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? So I do what I do. My purpose in coming here was to educate people about the damage that's being done to the majority of people by the Federal Reserve and indirectly by Congress and uh, the codependent partner. And I think I've done that to a good extent. I mean, I've been a small part of it because other people are spreading the word too, and it's good. Mm -hmm. um, I try to always do it in a humorous way, you know, because sometimes, you know, so I don't want to be like, everyone's like, oh, this is depressing. You know, it's like, well, yeah, but so yeah, here's a funny a picture. You know? Yeah, it's more memorable <laughs> that way too, honestly. Well, yeah, you don't want to just be doom scrolling. And I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I'm not a doomer. I'm not, you know, I had a guy a few, I don't know, years ago now tell me, oh, I'm going to, the U.S. is going to hell in a handbasket. It's like 10 or 15 years ago. He goes, I'm going to move to Honduras. And I'm like, oh, dude. Okay. Well, if the, if the, you know, if the, something hits the fan in, in the U.S., you, you don't want to be in Honduras. So um, I'm a dead ender. I'm going to be here. I'm American and, uh, and I love America and I want it to do well. But you got to change the Congress. You got to get out these, uh, these people like that are just total embarrassments like Dianne Feinstein or Mitch McConnell or Joe Biden. And on a, and on a younger, and a, just putting a younger person in isn't the solution either, because look at Kamala Harris. I mean, she is literally about as brain dead as Joe Biden is right now, just in a different way. Um, and, you know, uh, Congress is so corrupt. We have, you know, we have one party, you know, I mean, we, we really do. Um, I think I joked. Um, I don't know. I made a joke about that one time. It's really one party. It's two sides of one party. I mean, the Republicans love the Fed. I think right before Trump got elected, I said, uh, Trump's not going to be any better on on uh, on the Fed than Hillary will be. You know, he loves he loves the debt. 
he's a real estate guy from New York. He loves debt. So, and in fact, when he was in there, he was bashing Powell um, yeah. that he wasn't loose enough. Yeah, publicly. And then he actually, Powell, uh, Trump actually called for QE. Yep. Okay. So yep. Fed needs to go back to QE. And by the way, Druckenmiller, who, and many other people have said this, I have a post on that. Uh, there's nothing worse for most people than QE as far as wealth inequality. Yeah. And, right. and here's Trump calling for it. So the idea that Trump is going to save us or <laughs> Gavin Newsom or, you know, anybody, any of these people is a joke. It's a joke. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, I want to share with you about CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin alternative to health insurance. Health insurance costs are sky high today and you send your money every month to a massive corporation and then you never see that money again, even if you don't need a doctor. But if you do need care, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket, especially if you end up as one of the 20% of claims on average that aren't covered. CrowdHealth is all about community and the community crowdfunds everyone's health care. So if something happens to you and you need medical care, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and then the community helps you cover it. And in turn, you help cover others' needs, which has been so rewarding. I am so glad I switched to this program. And for more information, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie and use promo code Natalie for a discount. I am so excited to share that I have joined Orange Pill app as an advisor. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, you are missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping to create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You can create a profile and you will see lots of familiar faces there. And then you can search for Bitcoiners or Bitcoin events based on your location. I am geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm super grateful because the Orange Pill app has helped connect me with Bitcoiners in my new city. So come join us, download the Orange Pill app and head to theorangepillapp.com for more information. All right, back to the show. Your pinned tweet references the military industrial complex and the, yeah. the crime wave, the big bank crime wave. So are there um, things that you want to touch on with regards to maybe addressing some of those issues? Because one of the things we, we really have seen in this country is not just the hollowing out of the middle class and this rise of financialization, the wealth gap widening, but we have spent so much money on this military apparatus. We've become bullies across the world. People don't want these wars to continue continue. Um, and then on the on the bank side, like you kind of alluded to earlier, we have politicians who seem to, you know, be buddy buddy. No one knows who wear, wears the pants in that marriage of the politicians with the big banks. And these bankers have been getting away with basically just paying fines when they've been party to money laundering. I mean, some of the things that Whitney has obviously talked about is far worse, sex trafficking and all of that. And it's like, there are no consequences. So can you touch on maybe no. those topics that you are so passionate about as well? Yeah, there, there are no, um, they're unaccountable above a certain level. Uh, you're unaccountable. We see that all the time. I mean, Leon Black just paid off basically sex charges, I guess they were civil from the Virgin Islands. I mean, JP Morgan did the same thing paid yeah. off a bunch of people and people see that and they're like, I mean, if you or what, if, if someone found your, your laptop with the pictures that were on Hunter Biden's, I mean, you'd, you know, you'd be arrested, you'd be in jail. You'd be, they throw away the key, but Hunter Biden, you know, he's, I don't know the, the foreign policy in the United States. That's what that, even before 2008, I was, I was, I mean, just done with uh, Bush Cheney and, um, and people say, uh, you know, Trump was uh, when the GOP broke apart. No way. That was that happened under under Bush when he went in. Uh, you know, they, they had planned for, you know, years before 9-11 to go into Iraq. They, you know, they, they and in fact, we did. If you remember back in the early 90s, uh, the first desert storm. So uh, the, our foreign policy, this my lifetime really has been a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, we're American Empire, which is what Max Boot called for back yeah. in 2000, you know, and uh and people from New American Century, the Bill Crystals and the the Max Boots uh, and uh, David Frum, you know, but he was criticizing uh, conservatives who criticized protested against the Iraq war. He called them uh, basically saying, oh, you're allies with the terrorists. You know, I mean, even in the 50s, people didn't talk the way they talk now, except the most rabid, you know, uh, McCarthyite types. I mean, um, Mitt Romney, you know, a few years ago, was calling Tulsi Gabbard a Russian puppet or something because she was. She said, "Hey, I don't know what she said, but she's certainly not a Russian puppet." I mean, if you criticize anything about Ukraine, you know, uh, 
you're a you're a Putin puppet. I mean, that, that's how they avoid discourse. They just say, oh, you're a Putin puppet. Oh, you're a racist. Oh, you're a uh, conspiracy theorist. Oh, these are all terms they throw out now. I mean, you know, or- Orwell back in the 40s said something like, you know, nowadays fascist just means some something I don't like. You know, so we have all this degeneration of language and yeah. and things, you know, uh, that's being done. Um, but our, 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 you know, our military, I, you know, I, I differentiate between, of course, the people doing the actual fighting and the, and their, their commanders, because a lot of people, including Tulsi Gabbard went into the military thinking that they were yeah. going to fight bad guys that wanted to kill us. And right. I think we're just creating more bad guys. Yep. And, uh, and I'm not a pacifist, you know, and if, 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 if the Russians are coming up, the, you know, the beach here, um, I'll go out there with my shotgun and give it my best. But, but, uh, it, the, the idea that we're in 150 countries, I mean, now we're, I mean, I'm sure we have special forces in Niger right now or something, you know. And, you know, earlier you mentioned about how we, uh, someone was saying how we might have to cut entitlements. Yes, you know, well, maybe we don't send $100 billion to Ukraine. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just think it's not. There's a great article that says something like, you know, uh, Ukraine is a minor issue in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You know, people are just, their inflation's killing them. They, they're, they're upset. They think the country doesn't run correct doesn't run right anymore. And I think that that just nails it. The country doesn't run right anymore. And we're gaslit all the time. Ukraine is not an existential issue to the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the other, the other day there was a uh, study that came out that said that consumers said that inflation at home uh, was 20, they estimated 23% or so. And then, but they said, oh no, but the BLS said it was only 7% over the same period. I see those kind of things all the time because there's a disconnect between. Don't believe what your eyes are telling you. Yeah. Exactly. What are you going to believe? You're, you, you know, Bloomberg or your lion eyes. Yeah. And that that's they do that all the time, mm-hmm. all the time. And uh, or they'll do that. They'll show a video of, uh, you know, 50 people ransacking a, a store somewhere. And then the L.A. Times will say, well, is crime really as high as it as, as some people say? Well, it really isn't. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. I think being being in California, there's a, a, there's so much unreported crime now. People don't bother, you know, oh, because yeah. the police literally don't do unless you're murdering someone in front of a cop. Uh, they're not, they tend not to want to do anything. And, uh, and that's our leaders. That's the Gavin Newsom's and the London breeds of, of the world. And they're, they're horrible. So I hope, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you got to hit rock bottom before people say, you know, what? Uh, you know, I'm real progressive and everything, but maybe this isn't working out, you know? Um, now I see those, there was that recent video of the beating of those sick, uh, sick guy, S I K H, you know, that were, uh, their store was getting robbed and these guys apparently had been there many times or, and they're robbing. So they're beating them with sticks. So now they're going to charge the store owners with, you know, assault and battery, but they're probably, I think the, the burglars, if it's under nine fifty or something, it's a, it's a misdemeanor. It's just, it's just bizarro world. Oh, I've used that I'm, phrase for. I had to years. cover a lot of these stories when I was a, in California and I, I became at one point a part of the Exodus cause I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And it was really wild to me how they allowed law and order to just completely collapse um, yeah. convince, trying to convince people as if that, that, that was sort of the kind hearted thing to do and kind hearted <laughs> way to react. Yeah. Um, I, it was, it was very, you know, bizarre to me, but it does make me, you know, go back to that idea of, we see a lot of this, some people call it the fourth turning, right? Thing, things are sort of starting to, uh, to come apart at the seams faster and faster. Um, but it sounds like from everything that you've said, you do really have hope. You're staying here for a reason. You, you talk about how you love, um, you love this country, you love the values it stands for. You want to call this out. It seems like you're motivated because you ultimately believe that we can um, go back to a sense of, of what was right and uh, focus on, on our values and freedom and uh, collaboration and cooperation. Why, why do you feel, I guess, positive or, or do you maybe, am I right? Um, and, uh, and what motivates what motivates you to call all of this out on a personal level? Why are you so passionate about making sure people know this? I, I, I said years ago on here, the reason that I rail against these guys is because they are driving people to extremism with their wealth inequality boosting policies. And I think it's only gotten worse. I was railing about this when Bush was president, you know, George W., and it's only gotten so much worse. Um, I'm not, I say I'm a skeptic, not a cynic, because I still have hope and I do. Why do, why do I do this? I got, I got grandkids, you know, and I'm not a psychopath. 
you know, like, like Whitney Webb says, we got to do this for the kids. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people that have checked out. They're like, Oh, I'm moving to Idaho. Screw everybody. Or the FinTwit crowd, which is just like, basically, um, Hey, I'm making money, you know, screw everybody else. And, uh, that's not how I feel. And, um, so I'm a bleeding heart liberal, classical liberal, I guess, in, in that sense. Um, I think, uh, education is important. Um, ah, common ground. I mean, quit they not only do they like people stupid in this country i think intentionally i mean you hear about the school districts are just horrendous they don't know you're teaching kids they don't know how to add they can't they can't they can't read a rent agreement they i mean they don't know what a, what a bank account is you're not preparing them for life and i think the guys like brian moynihan love that and and so there's no education there and i think they like it that way and they also like left and right to be attacking each other old and young, black and white. They love it because wow. then, because then you're not looking at what they're doing there, which the top 1% has literally been, I mean, it's a visual. I'll, again, I'll put this out. You can see it. This wealth is being transferred upwards and it's not being transferred upwards to the, the guy that the entrepreneur that owns the pizza business, you know, it's being transferred upward to Larry Fink and, and uh, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and, because these guys have so much money, they benefit from all the asset appreciation. They don't care about inflation. You think Yellen cares what the price of a pizza is at the store? No. You know, I doubt she's been near one. You know, they, these guys live off the bubble. They're in a bubble. Yellen, there's an article where I read where Yellen, they said that Yellen lived next door to Ben Bernanke. And Donald Cohn, another old Fed hand idiot, is down the street. So I don't know where they live. I'm sure they have multiple homes. But how freaking bizarre is it that? Yellen li supposedly lives next door to Ben Bernanke. It's an inbred, you know, cesspool of, of unaccountable mediocrity. And uh, are they intentional? You know, Ben Bernanke's, I hear, making $20 million a year at Citadel. So apparently, if you're a sociopath, you don't care what you leave in your wake. I mean, Greenspan didn't. Although you mentioned earlier, he found religion after he left the Fed. A lot of guys tend to do that. I think uh, one of the worst... Uh, garbage guys was Bill Dudley. I think he got a little more sane after he left the Fed. Um, uh, Mervyn King over in the UK, you know, has actually said some things that make sense, but it, he waited until he left because they all want to be part of this club, you know? And uh, so anyway, getting back to what you can do, quit, look, find common ground with people. I, I have a lot of followers who are very right wing and a lot of followers who are very left wing. And I think they know, okay, I disagree with him on, you know, this, this or that, but I like what he does on the other stuff. And I don't harp. I, I don't have a litmus test. So many people like are nowadays, especially it's ridiculous. If you don't agree with me on every single hot button issue, then you're my enemy and you're a, you're a racist and a fascist and a Nazi and a, and a communist. And I can't talk to you. Right. And fortunately I have never, I have always been able to argue with you vehemently and then let's go have a beer. Mm -hmm. and, and, but a lot of people can't do that. And so I'm sure a lot of people that have blocked me, they can't do that. They, they found that they, I disagree on something that they, they just find beyond the pale. And so I want to find common ground. I think left and right. And there are, I have a lot of people like on the left to certainly to the left of Kamala and Joe who understand the danger of the fed, I think. And there's some on the right, because I think politics is a circle anyway, left and right to me are kind of meaningless and because uh, I'm all over the map. So I guess I'm a moderate because I have left views and right views. And, you know, some people think I'm a, a I've been called everything. I've been called a, everything from a communist to a Nazi to, uh, you know, a libtard or a Republican or, you know, so I, I don't care. I mean, I usually laugh and have toy with people that are I don't get many jerks anymore. Um, so but yeah, common ground. Quit. Let, let's let's get together on the things like um, it's so one of the saddest things of nowadays is that the vast majority of the Democratic Party has become raging warmongers. And it's shocking to see because that's when, I, you know, that was not the case, at least so much in the past, you know, I think, you know, and the, and the Republicans too. Everybody loves war. That's one bipartisan thing now is war. That's something where you'll get a 95 to 5 vote or something. And so, um, but we got to find common ground. We got to call these guys out. We got to stop voting for people. Vote for don't vote for the incumbent if you if they're connected to this, to the warmongers or to the to the to the uh, easy money you know freaks or the zerp people. Vote for the vote for the green candidate. Vote for the independent. Vote for the uh, you know the um, conservative party or whatever liberal party. You know, just vote for third party. Get we God we we so need 
we need a second party in this country is what we need. Yeah. And uh, and I think Robert F. Kennedy, that's part of his appeal is he's coming in like Trump, got a ton of baggage. Well, who doesn't? Right. Like Biden doesn't have baggage. Trump doesn't have baggage. But RFK is coming in. He's talking about things like uh, the banks and the and the middle class. And he's talking about the war, the wars. And, um, you know, Trump did that in 2015 and 16. And then, of course, I don't I, I think he failed. But um, but. I think that's important. You know, find common ground, quit, find out what we can agree on and discuss that because, you know, I, you know we're not going to sit here and, and talk for days about, you know, gun control. Like if I'm against it, some of us in favor of it, I just respect that you have a different opinion and that's fine. You know, and we don't need to, everything doesn't have to be an existential threat where I have to block you just because you disagree with me on something. Um, uh, I will block you yeah. if you're a jerk, but I mean, if you, if, yeah. if I feel like you're just, you know, I get them uh, called sea lions. These are people that come out of the blue. Usually they're non-followers and they go, oh, I heard you say this. What about that? And then they'll bug you for like 50 tweets. And then you got, you must get people like that sometimes, right? They go oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and it has, so that's, it's been fascinating no, to see that we've lost the ability to, to debate and to disagree. And we've just placed ourselves in sort of these two camps and it, everything's red or blue. Right. And, right. and, and, and things are so much more nuanced than that. And, uh, you know, I, I started following you actually because of someone I really admire in the Bitcoin space, Lynn Alden, who was um, pointing oh. to or responding to some of her tweets. And, uh, and she said something very, um, very insightful on, on a podcast that she did talking about how we, we just sort of ping pong back and forth, right? We, we elect this guy because we think it's going to be different and everybody rallies behind him. And then suddenly we realized, oh no, actually things got worse. Let's ping pong back to the other guy, uh, the other party. And then we, we, it's like back and forth, but the overall zoom out, the overall picture is middle class going away cost of living going up, cost of education going up, you know, more and more problems, crime going up. So it's clearly not being addressed by either political party. And I think we do need some more viable, you know, independent candidates and people who are not beholden to these massive donors, the corporations, right. the technocrats, the oligarchs. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I think our system, uh, it's, it's hard to change something that feels like it's so massive with so much power. Um, and again, it kind of makes you think of all those questions. There, there are probably some people who are totally ignorant and moving forward with the best of intentions, paving the road to hell, right? But then there are yeah. probably people, the tentacles and, and the puppet strings are being pulled by people who do have um, intentions to the, where, where they don't, at least they don't care uh, about harming yeah. people. Maybe they don't intend, but they don't care if they do harm people because they're just looking out for themselves. And so systemically, I think that there are so many problems, but going back to what you, you've said, you know, you can take care of the people around you, your community, um, your family, you know, and, and take the steps yeah. to, to kind of start small, start on the micro level that will hopefully um, trickle out uh, because, because there are so many issues, as you point out, but yet so many people do have hope. We always hope is what, what propels us to go forward, right? Yeah. Uh, it, you mentioned, well, we both have the sort of a number of times the middle class. I mean, the middle class is very important to this country. That's where I came out of. It's the, it's the, I mean, the poor, they bounce around between a half percent and 1% of all the income. And, and we, and there's a lot, there is a lot of safety nets for the poor, but the people in the middle, they don't have safety nets like the top 10% do or like the bottom 50% do. And really, I mean, in just speaking in generalities here, but the middle class is the heart of the nation. It's been decimated for the last 30 years as a result, partly as a result of, of, uh, or largely as a result, I think of monetary policy. And of course, a, a completely corrupt Congress, um, and all the wars. I mean, wars are expensive and we don't pay for, we just charge them to our grandkids, you know, and we charge everything to our grandkids. You know, uh, someone's going to pay this bill one day. And I've read, as I mentioned before, I've read a lot about Weimar Germany. Yeah, uh, It is very bad. And I'm not calling, like I said, it could be 50 years, but if we have a currency collapse someday, because we're so, we're not, I can't see how we're on a sustainable level of what we're going, but every, yeah, there's going to be pain. There's already been pain for a good chunk of America. People call the GFC. I always say, you mean great depression too? Cause that's probably what it's been for half of America. And people are like, ah, oh, what are you talking about? Well, okay. Best. I'm in a, a and I'm fortunate. I'm in a nice area. There, the food banks now nearby are off the charts. Record demand. Mm -hmm. But families, uh, individuals, uh, this is not a poor neighborhood. 
And so when I see the headlines, best economy ever, Joe Biden, right. you know, infl- I've cut inflation in half, blah, blah, blah. It's BS. And it's and it's, it's a- aggravating because he certainly hasn't talked to any of these people. He just, I don't think, I don't know that he talks to anybody, but, but it, it, that there are so many uh, problems where I see one thing on CNBC and I see another in other, either other readings or in real life. And um, so that's a problem. So we got to take care of the middle class because you mentioned earlier the morality of the country. It certainly deteriorated in Germany as the collapse went on yes. um, in the early 20s. And it because people had no future. If you can't, you know, uh, there's a guy named Kennedy who said, you know, pe- a man judges himself by the worth of what he makes, you know, is his money. And if the money is destroyed, his, it's almost like his he doesn't. He has no uh, no anchor. You know, he had to, mm-hmm. to measure things by. And uh, you know, look up what uh, Keynes, who's the favorite of all these goofball e- economists, mm-hmm. what he said about inflation. He says it's the best way to, to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. Right. And and so it's it's a big problem. And um, there's only there is the as uh, I think Thomas Mann called there's the hyenas of financial life who will do very well in hyperinflation. And, you know, maybe that's the top 1% or 2% or something. And the rest, there's probably some that are going to tread water and then the rest are just going to be destroyed. And if you remember Hitler's push, Beer Hall push was in 1923 at the height of the inflation. So I get, sometimes I get into what people says, oh, no, it was the 30s that, that caused the Germans to go insane. I said, no, they went insane in the, in the early 1920s with the hyperinflation. Um, I mean, of course, there were other factors, but that destroyed the morale of the country. Right. Uh, yeah. they, uh, they, having been robbed, the Germans became a nation of robbers. Right. And so when the depression hit and then you've got this Hitler gets out of jail and, you know, he's talking, hey, Germany again. And everyone is so demoralized and they've been so destroyed by the morality, a collapse of morality and the collapse of everything that they'd saved their life for under inflation that they, they look to him as a, as a savior. Yeah. And uh, he, you know, and then next thing you know, I don't know how many hundred million that died, you know. So there's yeah. consequences there are consequences in the future that neither of us could foresee as a result of Greenspan and Bernanke and Yellen and Powell. And none of these people will ever lose a night's sleep over it. And it's a shame. And I hope we can pull out. And I don't have all the answers, but I do know that the people we have in charge right now are not the answer. So do not vote for them. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. They do not care about you. I mean, OK, if you're Larry Fink, if you're listening, yes, they do care about you. But Bill Ackman, yes, they care about you. But they don't care about me or anybody else listening to this. So, you know, and I, again, I want to want to stay. I realize a lot of this is troubling, you know, because because the best thing to do would be just ignore all this and just, you know, keep buying NVIDIA and think that everything's wonderful. And, and a lot of people prefer to be ignorant. And but yeah. you need to be aware and now, protect yourself, whether it's Bitcoin or, or something else, you know. Right. I think education is key. Um, I think that's why it's so it's so worthwhile to have these conversations, because even if you reach just one person who starts to think about it a little bit more and educate themselves, I think it makes a world of a difference. Because right now, like yeah. like we said earlier, largely people are very um, financially illiterate. So you have to you know, we have to do our part to to help people understand. I certainly didn't. I had the veil over my eyes. Um, I at one point, you know, was on the camp of uh, thinking that more handouts are needed and the government it needs to tax the rich more. And, uh, and, I, and now I see how backwards I was thinking because I didn't understand basic economics. And so thank goodness I took the time and thank goodness for Bitcoin helping me uh, understand. Um, so uh, Rudy, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll start to wrap up here. Um, you know, thank you so much for, for taking the time. You're, like I said earlier, I really admire how much work you put into your really well-researched tweets and and the passion you have for shining a light on some of these issues because it's really sad to see what's happened to the average worker and it's sad to see them voting in a way that will continue to hurt them uh, even though they think they're doing their best because so many people are just focused on their nine to five and taking care of their families. And uh, I really do think that people are mostly good and uh, and want to help their neighbors and want to help themselves. So I guess one of, one of the places I want to leave this and one of my last questions to you is for that person out there who you just alluded to, you know, the decimated middle class that has no safety net and now can't afford an average like $400 emergency, how do they start to accumulate wealth and accumulate the ability to financially avoid some of the destruction that the monetary policies do? I've all, yeah, it's hard because it's, it's, I mean, you know, a burger now is 20 bucks, you know, at a, at a place. Uh, I, 
I guess I always had an aversion to debt. I again, I didn't get that from my parents. I don't know where, but I always disliked debt. So I guess try and get out of debt, especially credit card debt. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, they're paying 25%. I mean, yeah. you got to try and just pay that down, get out of it. Um, and you may have to forsake, you know, things uh, that, you know, nowadays seem like necessities, but like we never had, we never had an answering machine. We never certainly didn't have a cell phone. We didn't have Netflix. We didn't, there's so much nowadays that I think costs a lot, costs hundreds of dollars a month. And, and if you think about it, you know, 30 years ago or so, you know, nobody had that. And so do you really need it? I mean, maybe instead spend more time with your kids. Um, great quote from uh, Druckenmiller, I think, who said, you know, people ask me about quality versus quantity with kids. He says, he says, it's all quality time. Every time, every amount of time you spend with your kids or grandkids is quality time. So, mm -hmm. so don't, you know, so maybe you can save 150 or $200 a year on Netflix or cable or, I mean, I know this sounds like, you know, you know, uh, trite, but um, I don't know for someone who really is in the middle class and I don't know how, you know, that's why a lot of people have to leave California. It's so ridiculously expensive now. And I'm shocked at how expensive the rest of the country got during COVID. It's yeah. just, I see prices in Florida or Texas, like insane, but yeah. Um, yeah, just try to get out of debt, I guess, with the one piece of, of advice that I, you know, I know it's it's easier said than done, but try to do that, especially high high interest debt. And uh, the other thing, the other advice that I say I can offer people is stop watching all cable news. Turn it off. And and if Twitter bothers you, delete it. If Facebook bothers you, delete it. Don't. All they want to do is get you aggravated because a click is a click, whether you're whether you're cheering or whether you're enraged. Right. So they just want to you know, that's why you see some of these headlines that get everybody fired up. They're trying. All they want you to do is click. They don't care if you're happy or sad. So stop watching cable news. Don't go to the BuzzFeed type sites that get you all fired up and um, just try and do that. And you'll be much calmer. I mean, I I don't watch any cable news since Trump was elected. And I got to tell you, I've got friends coming up going, hey, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? And I'm like, no, man, I. I don't know anything about it. I'm perfectly happy. You know, my life is going on and you're all going to forget about it in a week anyway. So that, that's, that's the advice. So get out of debt and don't watch cable news. <laughs> well, that's good advice. Uh, it makes me sad to see where my industry that I wanted to be in since I was a little girl has gone. So I'm grateful that oh. now with the decentralization of media, I can do something like this and talk to oh. people like you, which I would not have been able to do at my, at some of my former networks. So, uh, oh, let me just say, our, you're, this is great. People like you getting people like Whitney Webb out or doing things like this. And also, our, as I've said many times, our media is all, our financial media is just awful. And our media in general is awful. So it's it's nice to have these voices like yours and mine, because I never would have been able to connect with some of the people I've connected with in a million years. But which is why they want to censor us so bad, which is why they want, you know, they want to shut us shut us down because we're not we're not following the, the narrative. But anyway, I, I really appreciate it. And I hope I didn't talk your ear off. I told you I was fired up today. So I love it. I'm sure the viewers and the listeners will love it too. Hopefully I'll, I'll get the chance to meet you in person someday. Thanks for everything that you do and the light that you shed on these really important topics. And hopefully we'll, we'll have you back and maybe we'll talk a little bit more uh, Bitcoin. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching the video version of the show. I really want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or guest recommendations, you can email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Please subscribe if you want more content and I'll see you next time.